You are watching the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show coming to you live from Ottawa, Tennessee, high atop White Oak Mountain in the valley of Snow Hill. We're so glad you have made a choice to be with us tonight on the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show. We've got a about that it works when you hit the right button hey thanks for joining us everybody i was i was running late and i, I ate a um, little debbie i just said john mcguire's uh tracy deidre smith thanks for watching john mcguire jr fitch join us uh thank you appreciate it mike williams join do y'all um uh, john mcguire do you have these up in um new england these little debbies little debbie cupcakes you've seen them they've got uh Oh, ho-hos like things, ding-dongs. Um, these little hostess, um, look like hostess cupcakes, but the little Debbie cupcakes. Yeah, let me get that better. There's a better shot right there. There it is. The little Debbie cupcake. Do y'all have those up in uh, New England? You got those? Anybody? You know, it's the number one snack cake in the world. In the world. In the world. And... Did you know these are made less than 10 miles from where I am sitting? I'm not kidding. McKee Foods is the maker of Little Debbie snack cakes, and they are located in a little town called Collegedale, Tennessee. It's in a little valley between the White Oak Mountain Range and another mountain range. And it's a quaint little, it's a, it's a village, and that's where Little Debbie is located, McKee Foods. And from where I work, my gas station, they're located about, oh, probably maybe three and a half miles. And when the wind blows just right, and I mean just right, you can smell the Little Debbie's being made at the McKee Foods factory. I kid you not. It, it's a wonderful place to live, the home of Little Debbie. I didn't know if you guys chomped on little debbies like we do. they've got a uh, they've got a little debbie thrift store you can go in you can go in this thrift store i kid you not and you can buy like a case of these things not a box you know not the box like you get at walmart now i'm talking about the case that where the box comes in for like five dollars and they're not old they're brand new right off the right off the uh, conveyor belt like five bucks you can buy little Debbie's for, they almost, you almost walk in and they go, here, Steve, have some little Debbie's. They're free. It, it's great. It's a great, great place. You're watching the Owlsness Barbecue Show. Not far from the home of little Debbie. We're brought to you by Michelin Tires. That's right, Michelin Tires. All of you competition guys getting on the road, check your tires on those trailers, especially. Check the tires on your trucks, your big F-250s, your big F-350s, your 10-ply LTs. You need a good tire. Michelin tire is the tire you want. Quality. Assurance. You know they're going to ride well. They're going to be smooth. And they're not going to leave you on the side of the road. Michelin tires. We're also brought to you by Butcher Barbecue and all the great products. From Dave Bosca and the Butcher family. Butcher products for years and years. One of the top makers of rubs. Spices, injectors, injections, grilling oils. And lots of other things. Butcher Barbecue. And we're also brought to you by the Pit Barrel Cooker. That's right, the Pit Barrel Cooker. Only $349. It comes in a box. Everything in that box is there that you need to start your grilling experience. For $349, you can be on your way to a great career in backyard cooking or competition cooking with the Pit Barrel Cooker. Available at my place. The Owls Nest Barbecue Supply right here in Ottawa, Tennessee. I want to thank our broadcast partners tonight who have started a watch party for us. The Backyard Smokers Barbecue on Facebook, Wes Phillips and his crew. Thank you, Wes, very much for doing that. We sure appreciate you so much. What the heck? There you go. And by Deidre and... Um, Deidre and um, the Smiths. 
over there at Let's Talk Q on Facebook. Two of my favorite Facebook pages. And uh, they do a great job keeping me up to date on stuff. Those are our broadcast partners tonight. Backyard Smokers Barbecue and Let's Talk Q. Go to those on Facebook and check them out. Lots of good information. Uh, they share all kinds of people on there. They share the pictures, share their recipes, share their, share their stories about barbecue. And that makes it just a whole lot of fun. Our guest tonight is Derek Riches. That's right. I said it's Derek Riches. Al, Al Selvage <laughs> says the honey buns off the line are to die for. Al used to work there. And he got fired for eating too many little Debbies. <laughs> Al Selvage, welcome to the show. Kent Vanderward, welcome to the show. Jeremy Slavin, welcome to the show. In just a few moments, Derek Riches will be joining us right here on the Al's Nest Barbecue Show. Derek is a barbecue journalist and uh, he is very knowledgeable. We're going to be talking about pellet smokers tonight because, as everybody knows, it's February the 6th. And as everybody in America that has anything to do with barbecue knows what happens on February the 6th. Weber is supposedly shipping the first run of Weber Smoke Fire EX4s and EX6s. And like, like everybody else, when I got my notification on email this week, I thought today was the day that we would get our smokers. So... I don't know how to read a tracking notice very well, apparently. Someone had to read it to me. We did not get the Weber EX6 like I had expected. Other, we got a bag of Weber pellets and the cover for the Weber Smokefire EX6. The EX6 should be shipped later, I have found out from carousing the internet and various Facebook pages. There's a Facebook page and it is great. Weber smoke fire insiders. If you are, if you are or have ordered the Weber smoke fire pellet cooker, go to Facebook and go to Weber smoke fire insiders. You'll have to ask to be admitted. It's a private group, but this group has been going since last fall and it has grown and it has grown and it has grown. And there's more information about this thing on there. And nobody's got it yet. That's what makes it such an incredible Facebook page. Everybody keeps talking about it. Everybody was sharing their stories. Just like I said, the anticipation is mounting. Never before have I seen in my short time in barbecue, seven years now, Anything is anticipated as the Weber Smokefire EX4 and EX6 pellet cookers. So when they come out, you rest assured you will be ready for a plethora, and I mean a plethora and a cornucopia of videos, unboxing this thing, putting this thing together, starting this thing up, firing it up, getting it up to 600 degrees, as advertised, because everybody knows the most important thing about a pellet cooker is, well, it's sear a steak. The Weber Smokefire EX6 and EX4 will sear a steak at 600 degrees, reportedly. And that's a big deal among pellet cookers. I don't have a pellet cooker. I know. I know. I don't have one. Can you believe it? I've never had one. I don't even know how to use one. I have gravity feed charcoal smokers. I have a stick burner, big stick burner, big Meyer mix and 48 uh, water cooker. I have an offset HBT made down here in uh, in Alabama, just south of us. A uh, big, big, big stick burner offset cooker, smoker. Um, got a couple Weber Smoky Mountains. Got a Genesis gas grill. Um, let's see what else I got. I've got that uh, PK thing, that grill. That's that's great grill. But I've never had a pellet cooker. I don't even know how to use one. So I ordered mine, and so I am in, 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 in anticipation as well for the arrival of the Weber Smoky Mountain. The Weber Smoke Fire pellet cooker. Can't wait. I cannot wait. I told the guys, guys, you're going to have to put this thing together for me at my gas station. And as soon as they get it together, we'll be live right here. Hey, before we get with Derek, I want to tell everybody, uh, April Saturday, April the 18th, here in uh, Chattanooga, down in Rossville, which is just over the border, 
the 2020 Veterans Barbecue Competition. Uh, it's going to be a little um, a little um, barbecue contest. If you if you're watching locally, Alvin and the guys, everybody here, Hal joined us. Hal Minterman joined us. Um, if you're interested in participating in this contest, go to uh, or email barbecueguys01 at gmail, and they'll get the information. And I'm going to get the information up on my Facebook page. I said that last week, but I didn't get it up. But that's too bad. But I will today, tonight. Uh, also, February the 28th and 29th, the National Barbecue Tour goes to Lebanon, Tennessee. That is the newest barbecue sanctioning body. They've just come up with it. Um, it's at the James Ward Ag Center. $225 is the cost for cook teams. I think you have to pay a $45 annual member fee, but that's not unreasonable. They've got room for 18 teams, and uh, all spaces have are paved with 30-amp service. And go to the National Barbecue Tour online and on Facebook for more information. Like I said, I am waiting. I can't wait for this Weber thing to get here. Just cannot wait. Um, can't remember when anything was this anticipated of delivery. I've got Derek Riches on with us tonight. I'm going to go to him in just a second. Derek is going to go over the history of the pellet smoker, the current situation of the pellet smokers, who's in, who's out, who makes the best one, who makes the worst one. And then we're going to talk about the, the phenomenon, this Weber pellet smoker. So I am, I am really cranked up to get with Derek on this thing. Let's go over here to the Skype machine. And we will call him up right now. It'll just take a second. Appreciate everybody joining us tonight. Hello, Derek. Hello. Hello. How are we doing? Good. How you doing, man? How you doing? Let's good, see. Good, good, good. Uh, hang on just a second. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Derek Rich is all the way from Utah. Utah. The square state. Yep. Yeah. Derek, what's that? Um, what's that little square on top of the uh, state that sticks up? <laughs> uh, I don't know the part where it fits into Wyoming. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I you know, when they drew the maps out here, they had no idea what the country was like, so they just drew straight lines. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to know what that thing was? I'm trying to find something here. Hey, everyone, let me take Derek Riches is here. Let me get the right page. Hold on. Switch. He is the author of a rotisserie grilling cookbook from 2017. He yeah. wrote Kebabs, 75 Recipes for Grilling, 2017. Both of these are available at Amazon.com. Derek resides in Utah, is a proud graduate of the University of Utah, home of the Utes. Besides being a writer, Derek is a researcher, tester, reviewer of all things barbecue. Derek, you've got the job that we all wish we had. That of a barbecue journalist. Welcome to the show, ma'am. Uh, no, it's great to be here. Oh, Glad you had me. Uh, just, I was just so, so thrilled when you you said you'd uh, come on and talk to us a little bit. As we start every show, we start every show with a little segment called How Smart Is My Guest? And let's see. You're smarter than the host because I, I can't find my music that I wanted to play. Maybe it's up here just a second. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. Okay. Derek Riches, for all the money. Okay. What is... Now, now, now you're going to think this is strange, but just bear with me, okay? Because we're going to tie it all together. And you may get it. What is the highest IQ ever recorded? You know... I'm going to go with you're, you're, you're thinking, 212. Whoa! Are you serious? That's your I answer. You, is that your final answer? You want to call a friend? Say that or like one ninety six. I'm not sure. Derek, it's somewhere two, in that. Range. It's two twenty eight. You were close. Two twenty eight. Yeah, two twenty eight. Okay. That's what I want right there. Well, All right. that's not my IQ. So, well, <laughs> mine either. But that's you were close, man. I mean, that's that's pretty good. Okay. Being an alumnus of the University yeah. of Utah. Who is the most famous alumnus of the University 
of Utah. I doubt it's me. Uh, let's see, who went to the University of Utah? You were, and everybody's thinking, where is he going with this? But just bear with me. Yeah, I have. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't. You don't know the most famous. I didn't meet them all. <laughs> this guy's way before your time. 1976. Utah medical school graduate, one Robert Jarvik. Do you know who? Uh, Robert, okay. Do you remember that name? I remember those days. Okay. Inventor. I remember that. Inventor of the Jarvik Seven artificial heart, that was first implanted into dentist Barney Clark, at the University of Utah mm -hmm. in 1982. Doctor Clark lived for 112 days. The heart was implanted by Doctor William DeVries. Because although Jarvik was graduated from Utah Medical School, he was a medical scientist and was never licensed to practice medicine. Not a surgeon, yeah. Now, here's where we tie it all together. Okay. Dr. Jarvik is married to one Marilyn Voss Savant. Savant. The person Smartest with the one highest in the world. Smartest person recorded in the world. That's IQ, right. Oh. A nifty 228. But you were really close on the 228. She's probably the president emeritus of Mensa. The average IQ is 100. Their oldest son, Billy Ron Jarvik, is the night manager at the Waffle House in Kingwood, Texas. I'm just kidding. He's not, yeah. He's not that. He, uh, Jarvik's uncle, though, Murray Jarvik, invented the nicotine patch. So how about that? Wow. You are one of the smartest guests because you almost got that. Almost. That's a tough yeah. question. But you didn't say like 700, you know, something <laughs> stupid or like, I wasn't that high. or like 80, something like that. All right. We got that out of the way. Before we get into the history of the pellet smoker, because that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Pellet smokers. What's, what's the history of Derek Riches? How did you go from... Graduate in 1994 from Utah to being one of the most prolific barbecue journalists in the nation. Well, it's kind of a strange story. Um, my my dad invented barbecue. <laughs> Give me a second. When I was a kid growing up, we lived on a large plot of land which was once cherry orchard. So we had a bunch of really old cherry trees. And our neighbor was a commander in the Navy who had been stationed in Japan in the 60s. And he had brought back to the United States with him on board an aircraft carrier, a Kamado grill. And when he decided he was, when he got reassigned and was gonna move, he gave it to my dad. And this is, I don't know, 71, 72. Okay. So he's got this big, strange thing that he has absolutely no idea what it is. I mean, this is pretty big green egg and all of that. So he starts kind of playing around with it and not wanting to buy charcoal because when we've got all this wood, he starts throwing cherry wood in there and starts cooking with it and realizes that this will hold nice low temperatures for long periods of time. So he starts cooking up roasts and whole chickens and doing all this sort of thing. Doesn't know anything really about real traditional barbecue. Right. So I grew up, he's cooking all this food and, you know, I'm enjoying it all. About 1990, I went down to San Marcos, Texas, stay with a friend of mine for a while. And he's taking me around to Fredericksburg and Braunfels and all these kind of central Texas places and we're eating barbecue. And he's like, you know, he, this is the introduction. He takes me to this place. I don't even know what it was called. I think it was in Fredericksburg. And he's like, you know, you got to try this. This real Texas smoked brisket. And you've never had anything like this before. And I take a bite of it and I says, yeah, my dad used to cook something like this when I was a kid. So... I figured my dad invented barbecue. He wasn't the first person to invent barbecue, but he kind of did it in his own way, on his own, without any outside influence. Yeah, and this is before the internet, before YouTube, before yeah. you can just become an expert almost overnight. So he's playing with, do you remember what brand that big Kamado was? Or do you still have it? 
No, no, it disintegrated mm -hmm. over time. The, they weren't really built to last. They didn't have the kind of the ceramics that we have today. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know. There was no markings on it. It was just what it was. It was, but it was, it was green and uh, it had most all the features to it. I think it was possibly one of the original dragon Kamados that came out of Japan mm -hmm. and then were later built in China in the 70s. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that was just kind of this weird thing. And so I started getting into, you know, smoking and doing stuff like that in, in the mid 90s. And then in uh, 97, I see this wanted, hiring people to run websites. Mm -hmm. And so just apply for it. We're going to pay you a monthly fee to run the website for us. And here's a list of topics. I look down the topics and there's barbecue and grilling. And I'm thinking, hey, I could do that. You know, truth is I didn't really know enough to do it at the time. I kind of learned as the years went by. But by, you know, 15 years later, I'm getting 30 million users a year and have a newsletter going out to half a million people. So wow, that's kind of how it happened. It's largely by accident so you jumped in with both feet though so you've been doing this basically since you got out of school i mean this isn't something you just stumbled yeah. upon like i did seven years ago this has been a lifelong or at least an adult lifelong passion of yours yeah i mean it's you know well what are we looking at now 23 years you know i remember my dad yeah, been... i remember my dad grilling one time in my life one time <laughs> My dad used to cook out a lot. He he was an avid fisher and hunter. He was quite the outdoorsman, and he if he didn't have to be inside, he wouldn't be inside. So he loved cooking out back and or at campsites. So I kind of always grew up with that. What do you? Um, what's your favorite vessel to cook on now? <sighs> That's hard to say. Um, I. Uh, I have, I've had a big green egg for a million years. I love that. Um, I actually, I like simplicity. I like charcoal. Uh, I will do a lot on a Weber kettle because I've been using one for more than 20 years. But, you know, other than that, I kind of get, I get cookers in a lot to work with. So, you know, something new comes in and that's what I'm cooking on. And, yeah. And then I just kind of keep moving from unit to unit. So a lot of times when you're cooking, you're working. Yeah, it's, you know, it's getting a feel for different yeah. types of cooking equipment. I mean, I test a lot of grills and smokers. So, you know, it's sometimes it's a couple of weeks of just cooking on one thing to just kind of figure out, you know, what's best for it and what's right and what's wrong. All right. I've got you in charge of the, the, uh, the Ray Rich's family reunion. We're all going to meet in Kansas City. And I'm okay, bring, I'm, bringing, work. I'm bringing the sides, and you're bringing the proteins. And and what what's the go-to protein that Derek Rich is going to bring that he knows is going to be foolproof, and everybody's going to love it? <sighs> well, that's a that's that's a that's a loaded question. Um, I love I love cooking brisket because it's a challenge. I mean, it's a bit of a more of a challenge. There's a lot more that can kind of go wrong with it. And if I'm going to be doing Kansas City, I'm probably going to be doing a lot of brisket, separating the flats and the points, and doing up some burn ends and mm -hmm. some good good brisket slices. So you're separating. And, you're doing. and we'll throw in some pork ribs for you know the other people. Okay, okay, I like it. I'm a brisket guy too. It's my favorite thing to cook. I love it. Yeah, it's my zen. So Mo Kaysan said, "It's my zen. It's my zen." Okay. Yeah, there's something. It, it's it, there's a bit more of an art to it, I think, than I agree. Than a lot of the other things. It's more fun to pick out the meat when you look for something. You get when I'm sitting there in Walmart looking at meat, and people come up to me and say, "What are you looking at?" I said, "I'm trying to pick out a brisket." Well, what are you looking for? Yeah. I said, "Well, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. This is no good. This is good. This is too much. This is not enough." And it's it's real science picking one out. It's not like a pork butt. You it look is. at it, you look at the money muscle, it goes, yeah, it looks good. Throw it in the buggy and you shag. Brisket's well, it's fun. it's it's a lot. It's very easy to pick up a bad brisket at the store. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I mean, you got that right. There's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of just, they're just not right in when it comes to briskets. Mm -hmm. I know you're right, but I like it. I like brisket too. Okay. Let's talk about the pellet smokers. Fill us in on the history of the pellet smoker. I got, I I said, I've never owned one and I am waiting on the Weber (laughs) smoke fire to get here. We're going to talk about that later in the show, but what is the historical journey of a pellet smoker? Who, what, when, where, and why? Well, you got to go back to the early 80s. Joe Traeger up in Washington State is working in kind of the pellet business. This is kind of coming up as a new renewable energy. Pellets are made from waste wood materials, and they're used for heating. And he gets the idea that he can turn this into a grill. And in 1986, he gets patent. And in hindsight, this is kind of an amazing patent because Joe Traeger for 20 years owns the complete rights to any type of outdoor cooking equipment powered by wood pellets. Wow. Grills, smokers, anything. No one can compete with them because it would be a patent violation. So, I mean, he gets this amazingly broad patent, but the problem is he's got to kind of convince people that they want to have one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's, that was, that turned out to be kind of a hard sell. It pellet grills have to be explained. They're, they're complicated mechanically. I mean, you've got fans, you've got an auger, you've got motors, you've got a temperature control unit. You know, you've got all this stuff going on. You know, when you're talking about charcoal grills or gas grills, people get that. They understand how they work. They're real straightforward. But when it came to, came to pellet grills, it was kind of a hard sell. And so, you know, he owns this patent from 1986 to 2006. And during that period of time, he manages to get up to about 2% of the outdoor cooking market. And the patent expires. And you've got all these other companies that have been making pellet water heaters, pellet furnaces, indoor heating stoves, that sort of stuff. And they're thinking, oh, well, you know, we can jump in here and we can make a better pellet grill and we can kind of get in there. So Traeger tries to cut its costs. They ship the manufacturing to China. They get a factory they're making them. There's quality control issues. There's all sorts of problems. Mm Mm-hmm. And Joe sells Traeger, the whole company, in 2008 for $12.5 million. Wow. And it kind of goes through some hands. But Traeger, has, since then, has been owned by private equity firms, these companies that just want to grow it to where they can resell it for a large profit. Mm-hmm. And I figure the company's now worth about 100 times what he sold it for. So Traeger, so, so Traeger is, they basically are the history of pellet cookers. Yeah. Like, there was nobody else. You know, they, and most so, pellet grills today, they still use pretty much the same design. And if you go out and get a barrel-shaped pellet grill, pellet smoker, it's basically, it's the same design in almost every way. The controllers have become a lot more sophisticated. I mean, that's the other thing. It's 1986, and you're trying to build a pellet smoker that's going to hold temperature, but, you know, the computer parts are just not there. I mean, you're working on real simple electronics to just get this thing to work. So you've got a high, medium, and low setting, and you got to kind of guess. You know, I mean, Mm -hmm. if you want it to be on low, but it's a real cold day, you've got to turn it to medium because it just won't keep the temperature. It doesn't know that. Now you have this, this, all this very sophisticated electronics in here. You know, all yeah. the Wi-Fi apps and, you know, well, we'll, we'll all get of to that, that stuff going But on. what, um, you know, the, the part that you brought up about you had to convince people. You know, it's like, you know, you know, when, when, when somebody asked Henry Ford one time, you know, they, they told him that the, the car wasn't going to work. And he said, if I'd have asked people what they needed, they would have said faster horses. You, you know, that's, you know, the vision, the vision that he yeah. had. How did how did this Joe Traeger fella? How did he convince? To, I mean, to capture two percent—that's pretty good, you know, pretty good yeah. in the grill market for one guy 
inventing something. I'm, I'm sure it's like the old Apple story. It's, it's invented invented in his barn or his garage or something. How did he? It's how did he? In a barn. How did he get it to the? You know, who took the chance? Who who did he know? Who was the guy that said, "I like it. We can do this." You know, it it was word of mouth for a long time. They uh, Joe would go out, and then later his sons, they would. They'd go to stores, they'd set one up, they'd cook food, they'd give it to people and say, here, this is what this will do. Taste the smokiness of it. This is this is cooking on a real wood fire. And, you know, they'd work to kind of just go shop to shop, town to town, marketing, mm -hmm. you know, this this grill. And um, do you think people and, people that saw it had tried smoking and said, hey, this just isn't for me. This is too intense. And do you think that do you think that, that when they saw this thing, the light bulb went off in their heads and going, yeah, that's that's what I'm talking about, something you can set it and forget it. Well, in the early days, you really couldn't set it and forget it. They uh, they were a little bit more temperamental, but still, yeah, I, there was a simplicity to it. I mean, that was, you know, I mean, that's kind of always been the thing about pellet grills. You know, you don't need to. You don't have to have lighter fluid. You don't have to have starter pellet, you know, starter cubes. You don't have to build a fire. You don't have to cut logs. You know, there's no stick here. There's just wood pellets and you buy them in a bag and you dump them in there and you get it going. So, you know, that simplicity has been a factor. And then, you know, by the late 90s, when the Internet really started coming on, Traeger was able to start getting, we're start spreading really online. Yeah. Um, through kind of the earliest websites and discussion forums and stuff like that. And that's kind of where it really started getting out of the area. I mean, I think for the first five, six years, they probably didn't sell a pellet grill outside of Washington State. Is that is that where but, it was headquartered first? Yeah. Okay. Because I, yeah. I, I knew they're in Utah now. I was going to ask you if you, had, if you had ever heard of them when you were monitoring or when you were promoting that website that you were talking about that you worked at. Did the was the Weber Grill part of that um, that website that you started working on out of college? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first when I first started getting into to writing about barbecue and grilling, um, you know, I would go to like some of the trade shows and some of those organizations, and someone told me probably like ninety nine, uh, you know, nineteen ninety nine. They said. You know, when it comes to cookers and, and the fan base, there are three thing there are three products you don't you don't attack, you don't disparage because their fans are rabid, and that was the big green egg, the Holland grill, and the Traeger pellet grill. Uh -huh. Because the people that love those things were fanatical about them. Still they just stuff, yeah. yeah, except Holland Grill doesn't exist anymore, but Yeah. But you know, the thing about the thing about the, the pellet smoker is you no know, normally you don't create a market; you service a market. And for one guy, yeah. the one guy to come out of his barn with a uh, a machine that, that literally it has turned the barbecue world upside down as far as the backyard person. I mean, there's no doubt. Oh, well, yeah. I have I have resisted and resisted and resisted it, and and I finally have given in. When it first when I heard it first came out, I was talking with David Bosca. I called it Satan. <laughs> the simplicity was 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 just so stupid that you know anybody could use it but as you as i studied it more and, and, and read about it it's uh the technology isn't stupid i was stupid the technology is fascinating that you can tell this thing to cook and i'm getting ahead of myself a little bit in the interview but that's all right you can tell it to cook what time you want the meat done and what time you're going to basically come back from playing golf and when i open that door i want it to be ready Oh yeah. yeah, that's what it's going to be. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's 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 a it, it has become a revolution. I mean, you know, for years I was kind of resistant. It was you know, in the the first knockoffs of Traeger first started coming on the market. I'm like, you know, pellet grills are okay, but here we go. You know, is it really barbecue? Yeah. Is it really? You know, I'm kind of a traditionalist that way, but. You know, now you just can't deny it. It's, it's such a huge, a huge thing. And, you know, the fact that all of these big companies now have their own, 
Palindrome lines. Okay, that know, was, uh, yeah. hold right there. Hold right. That was my next, that was that was my next question, question six. Question Fast six. forward to 2020. <laughs> it seems like every major corporation <laughs> other than Playtex is making a pellet smoker. Do you think this erode? Now, is this eroding? Hang on a minute. I got these piece of crap headphones. Derek, do you think the pellet smokers, are they eroding the base of, say, Traeger and some of the leaders? Or are they are they simply, is Traeger and these other companies, are they selling more smokers? And are they eroding the base of the offset pits? Because I'll tell you, this year, when I went into Walmart, my local Walmart, and I'm checking out all of the different grills they've got and smokers. It's a gas grill. It's a it's a hybrid, a gas and a uh, charcoal grill, and it's a pellet smoker. There's not one single offset smoker in there, and I can never remember that. And I and I just use I use Walmart because that's the closest mass marketer that I that I have to where I live. You know, I have to drive a little bit to go to Lowe's or Home Depot, but. Is it eroding? Are they fighting amongst themselves, or are they just stealing, stealing the sales from the other types of, of uh, vessels? So far, it's been that they're taking away from other product, other types of cookers. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of been a war on offset smokers for quite a while now. People say they're uneven; they don't cook right. You don't want one. I don't agree, but you know, I know that Kamado grill sales are down. I know that higher end charcoal grills and a lot of smoker sales are down. Um, it's hit it's hit a lot of traditional companies pretty hard because you know they were selling you know you're selling a thousand dollar stick burner or a thousand dollar Kamado grill or something like that and people are going to be looking well I can get this one and I can go I can go to the football game and check on it at halftime and adjust the temperatures and then come back and have food. Yeah. I can't do that with these other types of cookers. You know, I mean, uh, the first time I saw that kind of technology, it was from Mac Grills. And I was at a trade show in Atlanta, and they had they had a computer up showing a brisket, the, the temperatures on a brisket that was being cooked up uh, near Seattle. Cause, and that was the first time they made this like wireless technology mm-hmm. so you could do that. And so right now, the the competition, is, it's been pellet versus everyone else. And now, now that Weber's in there, now that Broil King's in there, now that um, Charbroil's in there, and now these other companies are in there, now I think is when we're going to start seeing a war between the pellet companies. Well, there's somebody... Um... Uh, that's what I was getting ready to ask you. I saw in our local Walmart, there's a few of the um, uh, pit boss in there, but very uh-huh. few. The, the the product that has taken the place of the pit boss, because last year it was it was all pit boss pellet smokers were in there, and that's all that was in there. Now this yeah. year, Cuisinart has taken over their their position that I can see at least where I am. And now explain that cuisine art, um, because I heard you the other night on Greg Rempe's show talking about that. And to me, that's a that's a, another aspect of what's going on that takes it even to another level in the, in the pellet business. Yeah, well, so cuisine art has this division on the side that does outdoor products. Mm-hmm. The Cuisinart company itself doesn't really care much about these outdoor products, but, you know, it fills out their their product catalog. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you actually go to Cuisinart website and you start looking through there, you got to kind of look for some of these, the outdoor cookers a little bit because it's, it's just an aside. But if you're Cuisinart and you go to Walmart and you say, hey, you want to carry our blenders and our food processors and all this sort of stuff. We want a certain amount of floor space for our new line of pellet grills. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's one of the things that, that these big companies have. And that's, I mean, this is the power that Weber has. And we're going to see that with, you know, anyone else who kind of comes in with these big brand names is they go into the, the big box retailers that they already have a relationship with. And they say, hey, nobody's hurt, you know, these little companies, that nobody really knows anything about 
squeeze them out. Put us in front of them. Put them in the back. They can be your discount products. We want big, better floor space, and we want you to carry our products, you know, on a, on a much broader scale. So that's like you know, like I said, now now the competition is going to be between the pellet grill companies, the pellet smoker companies, because now there's enough of them and enough big names with a lot of power that I think if I was a smaller pellet grill maker, I would be looking for a new way to market. Well, do you, do you think that do you think that the pellet we'll just call it the generic pellet smoker has 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 can you can you declare them the winner? And everybody else is just an also ran now and they're chasing the pellet cookers. Well, I, you know, in, in the backyard world, I know there's, you know, there's yeah. lots of different barbecue worlds out there, but uh, uh, in the, in the, the 90% of us that just cook say backyard that aren't interested in competition or anything like that. Yeah. You know, Ed Marin, fast Eddie. I know who he is. I don't know him. Yeah. Okay. He and I have had this argument for probably 20 years because he, he is a pellet fanatic. He loves pellet cookers. And he, he's been under this opinion, pellets will destroy gas grills. In the future, there will be no gas grills. I don't, I don't, I've never agreed and I still don't agree. There's always going to be gas grills. You know, Weber's going to come out with their, their pellet grill, but they're still going to make Weber Genesis and that Weber Genesis gas grill is still going to sell phenomenally well mm -hmm. and it's still going to be a big success. There's only so far pellet grills are going to go. You know, there's always going to be a market for charcoal, for stick burners, for gas, for, you know, those other things. But the, the pellet grill has expanded the market space a lot. There's people buying outdoor cookers that may not have in the past, and they've cut into all the other market spaces. So they've cut into everyone else's business, but it can only really go so far. I mean, there are people who just don't want a pellet grill. I mean, I know people who don't really like smoke flavor. Mm -hmm. They like grilling. They like gas grills. There, they there are like... people that, that don't have gas grills that won't have a gas grill. They have a charcoal grill. Yeah, yeah. Got and, there, and there's that. And there's always going to be the, the charcoal people, mm -hmm. you know, the ones who are right. Um, before, we, before we get to the Weber, how come every time you see an ad – for a, a pellet a pellet cooker, whether it be uh, a, a big ad like Trigger, uh, you know, their infomercials that they ran for a few years that were on Sunday mornings, uh, whether yeah. you're watching on YouTube, uh, what, what have you. The first thing they mention is how hot it'll get and how it'll sear a steak. And then then they back up from there. It, this, it's this... It's this cooker will do everything that your gas Genesis will do over here. It'll it'll sear the steak. So they, they automatically compare it to something that I've already got. That's why it didn't yeah. interest me. I'm not interested in searing a steak on it. If I want a steak yeah. seared, I've got a, a Genesis. I can get up to 750 degrees if I want to. So that part doesn't interest me. But it must interest most people because... These companies are smarter than I am, and they know what people want to hear. Well, you know, in some ways, that kind of goes back to the very beginning. When Joe Trigger introduced the pellet grill, he didn't know much of anything about smokers. He didn't know much of anything about barbecue. Hmm. The fact that people figured out you could cook low and slow and smoke on them, that kind of is an after effect. He was going after, he was trying to make a pellet powered gas grill. He was trying to make something that could be the okay. gas grill. Okay. And so for a long time, that was kind of where the focus was. This is a grill. It took off in the barbecue world because they're so good at holding a low temperature for a long period of time with almost no effort. So that's where that expansion really first started coming up. And then, you know, when barbecue got so big, you know, over the last decade, the pellet grill was perfectly in place for people who didn't know. They knew they had discovered what barbecue was, but they didn't know how to cook it. And now they had a machine that would do it easily. 
And so that's kind of where that went. But if you're going to get to a very broad audience, if you're going to sell to a lot of people, you've got to be able to say, oh, it'll do low and slow, but it'll steer a steak. Because for most, look, the number one thing that hits a grill is a hamburger. Mm -hmm. And the number two thing that hits a grill is a steak. And if you throw a steak on a pellet grill that can't manage to break over 400 degrees, you get a gray steak. Mm -hmm. it's, not a, it's not a good steak. Nope. So there's always been kind of, there's always been a way around it. The, you know, people like, oh, well, you know, you can sear on our pellet grill. You go out and you buy grill grates, those add nice aluminum cooking grates that um, Brad, what's his name, sells. And, you know, that'll hold in more heat. It'll give you more searing. You know, and then they started coming up with this kind of open baffle design where the de deflector in the pellet grill could be opened and you have that direct flame shot. Mm -hmm. So now you could get more intense cooking. But most most people, when they're buying, an, you know, something to cook outdoors, they're really thinking burgers and hot dogs and yeah, steaks not, and chicken. Yeah. They're, not, they're not thinking brisket and pork butts. So, so do, you, do you think the person with the cheap, uh, cheap grill on the back porch when they go to replace it, honey, you know this this thing's a piece of junk. It's got too many hot spots. When they go down to the Lowe's, Home Depot, whatever, Walmart, do you think that maybe that is where their decision process will take them from the gas to the pellet? Say this pellet will work, and and then do just simply do away with their gas grill. That's the problem is that gas grills are, are cheap. Yeah. At least they can be. Gas grills can be really cheap. Forever, the, the best selling gas grill in the world was the Charbro two burner quick set or whatever they wanted to call it. Sell for 100 bucks, 150 bucks. That's actually where most gas grills sell at. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody goes in and says, I'm, you know, when they're, in, if they have that mentality, if they're thinking, I want to just get a, you know, something for 200 bucks, please don't buy a pellet grill. Uh, you, don't so you don't think the upsell will be there. Yeah. But, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think that there's some people that are thinking, hey, my gas grill isn't working. I'm going to replace it. And now I'm looking at these pellet grills thinking, yeah, I could do that. I could go that route. Um, but, you know, getting a really good pellet grill getting one that has a lot of versatility is usually going to be a bigger investment than buying just a gas grill All or right, a charcoal before grill. Before we, move to, before we move on to Weber, for the for the money, for the value, first of all, Derek Riches, grill grates or no grill grates? Uh, you, you. I like them. I don't use them that much. <laughs> you I like them but don't use them. them. Okay. I, I do sometimes okay. if I'm doing something very specific, like, you know, I mean, like sometimes I will cook like, you know, uh, I have a PK grill and sometimes I'll right. do like a competition SCA steak for people, mm -hmm. you know, and that sort of stuff. And I'll break that, that out. Um, I've known Brad forever from when they first came out on the market and they're good. I, I like them for some things sometimes. I love them. I use them. Yeah, I mean, all the it's time. a good product. I, I, but... I love them. We have, I had a discussion with a, a group of friends today, and we were talking about it. And I made a note to ask you, grill grates or no grill grates? You like them sometimes. That's good. Good answer. I, well, it also I, I depends on what I'm cooking on, because I actually, you know, I've I've had grills that have very good cooking grates. They're very heavy. They're very massive. Mm -hmm. They have that good heat conduction. You know, when you're doing high temperature cooking. Uh, some grills, they just don't have the, they don't start out right. You need to kind of fix them up. See, I use them. I put them, I put them on my, I put them on my, my uh, gas. I've got a Genesis. I put them on there and use them on that. I put them on my PK. I put them on my uh, cheapo gas, gas grill that I've got at my, at my shop that I cook, you know, chicken wings on. I like them because they keep, it keeps the flare down. That's, that was the number of things I can cook hot and you keep yeah. the, the flame down. That's what I like about it. That's I think. Well, I've recommended that to people. You know, people say, oh, you know, I've got a grill. I don't want to buy a new one, but I'm having so many flare-up problems. Yeah. I'm saying, go buy these. Go buy these. Put them in your grill. You'll never worry about your flare-ups again. Yeah, good product. I don't know how we got off on that, but that's okay. It's okay. All right. 
Fast forward <clears throat> again. Uh, the Weber smoke fire was out today. Never, and, and I was the biggest whiner online because mine didn't come today. But I wasn't alone. A lot of people whined yeah. that it wasn't there today. Have you ever seen anything more anticipated than this thing? Yeah, I can't think of anything in the industry that has had has been hyped this well, has had this much anticipation. It's you're, you're combining the hottest new product in outdoor cooking with the most recognized brand name. So yeah, it's it's big. It's a big deal. What um five years ago did you ever scratch your head and say, I wonder why Weber doesn't make a pellet smoker? And did no. you ask him? You never. I, I know they've been working on this for about three years. Mm -hmm. Probably been toying with the idea for at least four. But, you know, that Weber, Weber is pretty secretive. They don't like to talk about what's coming on until they're ready to say what it is. Mm -hmm. Did you? So, um, did, I'm you, not surprised now. I was right going to say, I'm were you surprised when you found out that they were in the, in the business? Or did you think that? You know they were they were true to their little Smoky Mountains and the Genesis, and they, you thought maybe they were just set with what they had. That's the, that's what I always thought. I thought that's why they didn't have one. They they were they were happy with what they had, and they thought that the pellet thing was going to be just a passing fad. You know, I've never known Weber to not try to capitalize on a market space if there's if they can make money on it they will get into it but at the same time they spend a lot of resources making sure they do it right the first time mm -hmm. Weber does not want to be seen making a mistake they're very conscious of that so so they want to make sure that this works and that's actually one of the reasons why I think it kind of has been delayed as I think there's been a software issue Oh, okay. And they've kind of held held it back a little bit. I mean, they never, Weber never officially said, this is the day. They said, the early part of 2020. It's going to be early 2020. First quarter of 2020. Mm -hmm. They gave themselves a window. It's Amazon and, and Lowe's that came in and said, here's our ship date. Yeah. And do you think that put the that pressure on Weber saying that? Did that put the pressure on Weber? Not really. I think, if anything, I don't think the delay is, has hurt them. I mean, it's it's February. This is not the prime buying time right, right now. It's going to be, you know, it had to be there by March. March 1, it had to be there, and it will be. So they're, they're in good place. The um, Does this have more software? Than any other smoker that you've seen, can it do actually do more of what they're touting? Because I've heard. Well, I'd like to actually see it in action. I mean, really be able to to you know to fully comment on that. But from everything they're saying, the idea you know I mean they're literally saying, hey, you wanna you wanna smoke a pork butt? You wanna cook a whole chicken? You want this? You tell us when you want it ready, and we'll have the cooker get it there for you. Yeah, it, it's That's... backwards. It's backwards of everything we've been taught about barbecue. Because the number one question people ask me is, "How long do I cook it?" And the answer is always and... the same: until it's done. You, you know, right? You, you and that's always, because that's always that's, been the rule of barbecue. Because that's the barbecue, barbecue knows when it's done. Yeah, and it, you know, and if you're observant, you'll see that. Um. We'll see how well this works out because, you know, I would love to throw a brisket in one of these, plug it in and say, hey, all right, computer. All right, Weber, cook my brisket and, and see how it comes out. And um, and hopefully and hopefully it'll come out good and not you won't have to write them a letter and say, I got <laughs> home. I got home from the golf course and I was looking at a hamburger. I burned a yeah, burned up well, hamburger on my uh, smoke fire EX. EX6. Uh, um, you know, I, I just wonder. I go over a lot of friends' houses, and they've all got they've all got two things on their deck. They've got a green egg, or some sort of maybe a Walmart Kamado, or a, you know, a knockoff Kamado, what have you. 
Right. It sits over in the corner and it's all, it's, it's usually, it usually doesn't have a cover, but if it's got a cover on it, it's dusty. You can tell it's, it hasn't been used. And right next to it is the gas grill. And mm-hmm. that's, that's getting the action. You know, the Kamado was something Father's Day-ish maybe, uh, or, you know, a, a moment of uh, high testosterone in the Ace hardware where, you know, oh, there's, the, uh, yeah, I got to have that. A few grunts get it home and they cook on it once or twice and say, you know, this thing isn't real easy to use. And so they use that gas grill. Uh, I'm just wondering if you think that the, do uh, you think the Weber might be the new, I call it the status grill, uh, just something that we got to have to impress our friends? It could be. I mean, it could very well be. I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people hyping it. Um, social media is going to be flooded in in the next couple of weeks with people cooking on their smoke fire Mm -hmm. and that's going to be that's going to be the story this year it's going to be all over the place and if it works out well weber could really dominate the market space yeah derek i think it's going to be the grill down for this year i'm sure you saw the same videos i saw when they had those people up at the headquarters at weber and they i don't know you may have been one of those people i don't know they were they were all using this this Weber, they all set it up and they were in all of them. They were very few of them were smoking on most of them were grilling, you know, grilling different items on it. What, um, is this, is this something that you, you or I could take and you don't have to use the computer. Can you just like override it? Say, I'm going to set it at 285. I'm going to put my brisket on there and I'm just going to, I'm going to have a beer and I'm going to sit back and watch it in my driveway. Is, is it going to have that capability? Is it going to have the simplicity one? Yeah. No, I, you can. You will be able to just go say, hey, this is the temperature I want. Just stay here. Okay. Don't pay attention. To, you know, just do that. Okay. Um, it, it would be foolish to not be that way. Because, you know. I thought so. They're, they're having this idea. It's like, hey, we're, we have... I don't know, 700 to 1,000 recipes built into this app, and you buy this stuff, and you s- tell the grill that this is what you want to make, and you put the temperature probe right here, and then you set it on there, and we're going to just tell you what to do. Well, that would really be annoying the fourth time you made that thing. Right. Because you know what you're doing now. Yeah. You know? It's going to teach people. It might teach people cooking. It might teach people how to use the grill and, and for them to get to know it that way. But yeah, I mean, I've had pellet cookers with very sophisticated electronics, and I, you know, if I'm just cooking on it, I set my temperature, put my food on, I'm done. I don't use the temperature probes. I don't monitor it that way. I just make sure it's running. On your experience, so in your experience of testing all these smokers that you get to test. Which is, which brand and which model number, if you can remember it, the model number, was the most technologically advanced that you've seen so far? Well, the most technologically advanced cooker I've seen, well, okay, so actually it's not. Four years ago, Lynx came out with a computer-controlled gas grill it, the, you had an app for it and it would you could adjust the temperature you could turn burners up and down you could do all sorts of stuff with it i mean it costs like six thousand dollars uh i think that twin eagles has twin eagles came out with a pellet grill last year for seventy five hundred dollars um it will use probably half the pellets per hour as smoke fire because it's incredibly insulated mm-hmm. and it has pretty much equal electronics, but it costs seven and a half times as much as your EX4 is going to cost. Well, that's 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 not that's out of the. Yeah, that's out of. That's, I mean, that's that's a luxury item. Yeah, that's, that's one that's hundredth for, percent of the sales. Nobody yeah, knows. that's for billionaires and politicians. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. One and two are the same. Um, I'm anxious to get mine. I'm sure you're anxious to cook on one. How will you? Uh, will you get to cook on one? Will they make? Is there like a, a press thing that you've been invited to, or, or some sort of a, a gathering that Weber's well, going to have? Well, I'm working on, on getting one here. Okay. Um, I 
The problem with, you know, when they have these PR events and they say, hey, come up here and cook on this. We bought you the food. We're going to season the food for you. We're going to supervise you cooking it. We're going to see what you do, and we're going to make sure you don't make a mistake. I mean, when I test things, I'm like, what are the most common mistakes people make? Mm -hmm. What are they going to do wrong? And what happens when you do that? So and I, and I think it takes I like, some of the. I think it takes some of the the, the bias away too. There, if they fly you up there and every, you're going to love it. It's like it's like the barbecue guy that cooks for his family all the time says, "Oh, they love my barbecue." I must be a great barbecue cooker. Yeah, I don't. I don't have to. Yeah, do, that's I don't have to that's the problem with these uh, PR events. The marketing people want to make sure that you are one hundred percent satisfied with what they were presenting. Mm -hmm. I I test things by breaking them. <laughs> that's you know what yeah. what can I what can I do to wh where is it going to break? What's going to go wrong here? Yeah, because that's you know I mean that's when people are reading reviews they don't it's like. Oh, well, it worked great on the showroom floor or the first time you cooked on it, it went great. But if you do something slightly wrong, is it going to destroy it? Are you going to be 200 bucks getting it fixed? Is it just going to shut down? So, is the wheel going to fit between the is the wheel going to fit between the wood on my deck and turn over? I you know, it's the small things like that. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. There's there are there's some really dumb little details that a lot of manufacturers kind of miss. Who, well, who among, also, us, who among us hasn't dumped a charcoal grill before? I mean, I've dumped the whole thing, just knocked it over. Yeah. I mean, you, you, that will happen. You're horsing around, or somebody's kid runs over to it, and you you run to grab the kid so they don't burn themselves, and your shirt tail gets hooked on the edge of that PK cooker, that little aluminum part that sticks out that just grabbed my shirt tail and grabbed <laughs> it, and I turned it around and. And all of a sudden, I looked at it, and it was following me, like a car chase in the French Connection, and then boom, yeah, it yeah, goes that's... over. You know, so yeah, I mean, things like that happen. Oh, to it's me. true. To Plus, me, there's also you know, you want to assemble it. I mean, for me, it's like I want to put it together. I want to see what the instructions say. I want to see what the parts are like, because you know, the number of times people have sent me a grill or a smoker, and I tried to put it together, and it's like you know, the screws are on the wrong side. The holes aren't right. Yeah. yeah. This doesn't fit here. Because if I have to get the sledgehammer out to get this thing apart, you've got a problem. Yeah, no kidding. I don't expect that from Weber, although I did have a problem with one of their gas grills that couldn't actually be put together right. Because of the parts they'd furnished? Yeah. And the, it, uh, something I had to do with the way it had been packaged, the packaging bent something that then made it so it wouldn't line up. They changed the packaging, but I mean, I think it was one of the first people to ever have it. But, you know, I mean, that happens. Well, well, Derek Riches, thank you so much, man. I appreciate you being here with us. Uh, you're a great guest. Your, your knowledge is uh, beyond comprehension for me. You know, in the knowledge of barbecuing and grilling and, uh, smokers and the history and the, the whole the whole kit and caboodle and i appreciate you sharing that knowledge with us um i was hoping i was really hoping that we'd get the uh weber today because i was gonna i was going to team up with you and we were going to do a live thing from my gas station putting the weber together but that was not meant to be but maybe someday it will be so uh all right i'm sure it'll show up eventually well let's do this again all right yeah, I definitely. enjoyed it, Thanks man. I, I really enjoyed it. You're 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 a great guy and a great guest, and I appreciate your time. And I know everybody watching. Uh, we had a bunch of people watching tonight, man. We may have we may have set a record for the Alzness Barbecue Show, but uh, oh, good, you got a great show going. Well, you're 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 a great guest, and I appreciate it. And we'll talk to you uh, sooner than later. I promise you. Thank you so much, Derek Riches. Everybody, straight from Utah. Uh, what a great guest. What a great guy. What a great guy. Hey, we got to go, man. We got to go. We got to go. We're just a little bit over, but that's okay. I want to do this. And I want to do this real quick. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hang with me. Hang with me. Where is it? Right there. I want to remind everybody that. Let's see. Don't forget, tomorrow night, Friday night, you can hear Jeff Rice, Ricer of Dead Broke Barbecue. He's got Tavern Talk live on YouTube. That's at 9 o'clock. Go to Dead Broke Barbecue. You can check out Ricer 
on Tavern Talk Barbecue at 9 o'clock. On Monday night, it's Chewing the Fat with Brian Jarvis, sponsored by the Atlanta Barbecue Store. That is 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Facebook. Tuesday afternoons, you can hear uh, In the Pit with Johnny Mags and Messy Mike at 5 o'clock live on Facebook. Tuesday night, the granddaddy of them all, the Barbecue Central Show with Greg Rempe live on Facebook and YouTube at 9 o'clock. Two hours of the best barbecue information in the United States. And on Wednesday nights, don't forget, Sandy Smith, Just Piddling Barbecue on YouTube at 8 o'clock. He and his wife, Brandy, We've got a unique little show. It's kind of a town hall barbecue show. I like it, and I promise if you watch it, you will like it too. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Next week, we have got a representative of the National Barbecue Tour who will be with us, and we'll be talking about that event coming up uh, February the 28th, I believe, 28th and 29th in Lebanon, Tennessee. So stay with us until then next Thursday. Everybody, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Good night and good luck. Thank you for listening to the Owl's Nest Barbecue Show with Steve Ray, broadcasting from the Owl's Nest Barbecue Research and Development Center in Ottawa, Tennessee.